Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar from the Mental Health Professional Network. We are, I guess, right in the midst of the COVID crisis, and this is a really good chance to talk about working with children and families during this time. I'll introduce the panel and uh, welcome uh, the over a thousand people who have joined us so far. But I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia, uh, upon which our webinar presenters and you as our participants are located. We wish to pay our respects to the elders past, present and future, for the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. So Steve Trumbull's my name, I'll be facilitating tonight's session. I'm a GP by background, but my current role is as Head of Medical Education at the University of Melbourne, Melbourne Medical School, and uh, thoroughly enjoying um, facilitating webinars for MHPN, although I guess for all of us, webinars are not quite the novelty they were a month or two ago. <laughs> I am going to introduce the panel, though, and we do have a commitment to making tonight an interesting and uh, entertaining and, most of all, educational session for all of you who are giving up your precious time with family and friends and just taking time for yourselves uh, to uh, have this conversation. So I'd like to start by introducing Andrew Leach, who's a general practitioner like me, but on the other side of the country in Western Australia. So welcome, Andrew, fellow GP. Thanks, Dee. Thanks for having me tonight. It's great to be here. Great to have you. And I'm just curious, as a fellow GP, what's going on in your practice and what are you currently seeing or dealing with um, children who have or who are, I guess, coping with the pandemic as we all are? Um, it's changing. Gen I, I never imagined general practice to be like this. We've seen a real shift, a real transformation in how we practice medicine. And that's in a matter of four to six weeks something we weren't taught at medical school is how to do telehealth and so it's been a big learning curve for us um, and it's taken a little bit of extra work to try and get the history we need from parents from families um, even from children um, and to ensure that safety of those families but Steve like on the other hand there's been some massive benefits from having telehealth being able to contact people easily over the phone and being able to take a little bit of extra history and a little bit extra time to to hear what's going on for them and check in on them and make sure they're coping with this this whole event. So there's there's pros and cons, and I'd like to sort of talk about those as we we go through tonight. Um, but general practice definitely a, a different uh, field of medicine at the moment. Yeah, well, we'll certainly have that conversation with uh, the other panelists as well, because you know there are some things that have changed in this that we might never want to go back from. There do seem to be mm. you know, issues of improved accessibility for some people with the use of telemedicine. But it will be an interesting conversation about whether there's a unique skill set we need to use in telemedicine or whether it's really just technology enabled good communication. So we'll definitely have that conversation, <laughs> but uh, mm. definitely welcome. Now, Thank the you. next, great to have you. Uh, the next person who we will um, be meeting is actually not Julianne, it's Nicola. <laughs> so, <laughs> hello Nicola. Now, you're a, a clinical psychologist based in the ACT. How's your practice been impacted by the pandemic and what are you doing with children these days? Is the difference? Well, I think, um, hello everybody and thanks for having me tonight. I think what we're seeing um, with children and families in my work at the moment is uh, lots of questions, I suppose. The things that existed before the pandemic continue, but there's lots of questions about what parents and families should be worrying about, what they should be letting go, what they should be prioritising, um, whether that be around uh, home education, um, around wellbeing, and yeah, trying to work out the balance, I think, is probably the biggest thing that um, we're hearing that families want some, some guidance on. Balance is a really interesting word. I don't think any of us expected in our lifetimes the world to be quite so tipped. Uh, everything mm -hmm. is settled and obviously children, like all of us, are struggling to deal with that unsettlement. Well, it's great to have you, Nicola. Very much welcome. Now, Thank Julianne. So oh, thanks so much, Steve. Yeah. So ah, look out for Yes, yes. And it's just wonderful to be on this panel with you guys. It's really exciting. Um, yeah, our work has changed. It's really interesting, actually. I've got, you know, managing quite a few kids who are really struggling out in the rural area here with um, internet bandwidth and 
you know, computers freezing, they're trying to do their schoolwork and, you know, we've had a couple of kids that haven't wanted to talk to us too because mum and dad have been around and they haven't been able to find a private space. So that's been a bit challenging in negotiating that. We're doing a lot of pre-phone calls to families and some of the younger adolescents too to check that they're okay and they're safe and they can talk clearly. Um, negotiating, you know, those that can come in too has really been interesting. And so, um, we're doing an awful lot more of talking with people in the preliminary prior to sessions. Mm -hmm. So um, that's taking a bit of extra admin work. And I know at the end of the day, I'm, I'm feeling really scrambled actually by the end of the day. But I'm thinking, God, my desk looks like a dog's breakfast. And uh, <laughs> hopefully people can't see that here tonight. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I think, God, have I done anything? And now I'm going to do notes. <laughs> Is that a different way to the way you're practicing? Are you not getting a break from your desk and it's just all building up? No, I up? find I'm absolutely, Steve. I'm just here all the time because we're using whatever moment we can to catch people, especially some of our young. We've seen quite a few um, you know, people in their 12, 13, 14, year 70, year 9, and um, they're, they're really struggling between schoolwork and mum and dad and younger siblings being around. Um, so we're trying to catch them when we can, when it's convenient. Um, and I'm finding it, that that proving quite tricky and also negotiating like I'm trying to have sort of different screens with kids so we're doing different conversations so I'm showing them my room so I've got to learn how to pick my laptop up and move it around <laughs> because I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with with how to be because I'm a very active in my work with children I move a lot in the room I'm finding I've got to sit at the desk and get my hands up here and not look like you know who do you do of um, you know the Muppets <laughs> you know, I find I've got to get my hands here and I'm pointing to the I hold up to the screen is backwards. Anyway, I won't keep talking. So, it's tricky. We're seven minutes in and Julianne's doing Swedish chef impersonation. This is <laughs> I actually see there's a number of people joined us looking at the chat from schools, a lot of people who are school counsellors, psychologists, um, pastoral care, various things like that. So I suspect there's going to be quite a lot of conversation will be relevant to that group as we talk about schools. I just wanted to, so welcome to the three of you. I just wanted to run through a few um, platform issues to make sure that everybody who's watching uh, can access the platform appropriately. You'll see that there's a number of buttons, um, usually at the top right of your screen. Uh, there's a chat box button, which is purple. So click on that if you want to put something in the chat box that all your colleagues can see around Australia. If you've got a question, please put that in the blue box. There's um, also a light blue download box that will allow you to um, download resources at the end of the webinar. There is also a help button, a big friendly help button. So please uh, click that if you need assistance with the platform. I see some people are having some buffering issues, which will unfortunately be at your end. Uh, thank you to the NDN for, uh, for that. Um, and you can call with a number that you all there as well to get assistance if need be. This is a different um, webinar to what we usually offer. This is actually not based around a case. To be honest, when it was being set up, things were happening so quickly that we figured any case was going to lack authenticity by the time it got to tonight. And we thought that it would actually be more useful for people who are participating tonight for us to have a Q&A type conversation like the ABC TV show where we will respond to questions and the panel that you've got here tonight will be able to talk with each other um, in response to your questions. We do have some um, learning, act, uh, sorry, learning outcomes that we'd be very keen to cover over the course of the hour or so that we've got with the webinar. Uh, the first one, and I'll just make sure that I'm on the right slide there, which would be that one. Uh, is to outline appropriate language to use with children. And when we say children, we mean children and adolescents. We're going to try to cover the full age range for those who might be involved with preschool, primary and secondary school children, as well as, I guess, young adults even. But what, what are the appropriate words to use when we're talking with children, when explaining coronavirus, the pandemic, and also what's happening within their current world and their future environment? The next learning outcome is that we would like to talk about specific tips and strategies, so practical tips and strategies that can help a child feel safe and secure during this outbreak as much as we possibly can. And the third learning outcome that we would like to achieve by the end of the webinar is to discuss the importance of collaboration 
and appropriate referrals when supporting a child and those who care for them who are having concerns around their mental health during the coronavirus outbreak. So it's a big ask, but then again, we do think that a sort of a Q&A type approach is going to set us up best rather than trying to keep to a case which might have been not terribly realistic at this stage of the pandemic because who knew how it was going to turn out um, from a month ago to where we are now. So let's jump in now to their... Um, to the questions that have been popping up. Uh, we do have some questions and we did get some questions coming through earlier that we'd like to talk about. But actually, um, Anne, Anne Tench has gone straight into one of the areas that we were keen to talk about, and I guess this is as good a time as any. It's about children with special needs. Um, and I guess that would include everything from children who might be on the autistic spectrum uh, or causes of intellectual disability, learning difficulties and things like that. Uh, and what, what Anne was particularly asking about were the um, disruptions, or sorry, was the disruption to the dynamics of family and school, all those very carefully established routines which have been thrown out the window. And whether any of the panellists are able to talk about what their approach is to working with families uh, with children who have special needs who are put in a word, discombobulated by the world being turned upside down when order seems to be the better way to go. So any of the panellists like to take on that one? Nicola, is that something that you would respond to? Uh, I think um, one of the things that we are aware of is the disruption to routines. And for some children with special needs, the reduction in social interactions um, and having to, to negotiate that every day can be a benefit. And I think in all of these discussions tonight, it's also helpful to look, as we've mentioned before, at the benefits um, of this. So some children may benefit from it, having to have less um, to negotiate each day, I suppose. But I think um, I am going to defer to the other panellists because it's certainly not my area of expertise, my notion would be that the families and health professionals that work with children who have particular uh, special needs, whatever they may be, I think it's really important for families to keep engaged with them and to work with work with them around what they can set up if they're operating from home, um, how that can, to get some support in what that modification could be because it could feel quite overwhelming but that's what the supports are there to do. But I know that uh, my other panellists have, have got more experience than me in this particular area so I'm going to pass over to them and you can throw me some curly ones later, Steve. <laughs> well, I know you don't play much Australian <laughs> rules in ACT there, Nicola, but I think we call that a handball, hand pass, but that's fine. And it's good, actually. Yeah, I, I grew uh, up in Tassie. I know what a hand pass is. <laughs> okay, you're all over it then. Maybe even add to it a question that David Poons asked about how we would notice that a child's having problems, now a child with a disability or a child with that, that's likely to, I guess, occur at school or for a problem to be brought to the general practitioner. Um, I'm wondering, yeah, I Julia. That. Oh, Andrew, oh, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, I was just going to answer that first question as well. Um, and I think Nicola's spot on. These children need as much support as they can get. So um, from a general practice point of view, um, these families really need to reach out and see their GP or talk to their GP and, and discuss the concerns they're having at home and what challenges this is bringing up for them. Um, as the routine is shifted and changed and as they lose some of those other contacts and supports, maybe this is a, a really good role for a GP to coordinate that help. Um, but to also continue that collaboration with the team and usually children with disabilities, um, have a team around them already um, engage with them and really making sure that that's continuing in the background that, you know, amongst all the chaos, there's still that therapy going on and whilst we've changed the way we do that therapy in some situations, um, there's still some um, benefit from having that support and having that knowledge that you can talk to someone about it. And I know from parents that have talked to me, they've said, it's just so helpful to know that we can, we can call up and get some help if we need it and to be able to talk to your health professional about um, what's going on around us. And, and I think so. Their parents are looking for reassurance and they're looking for that, that contact, that ability to contact and still be engaged with therapy. And, um, and and that's probably my, my viewpoint on it is, is continuing that therapy and continuing that collaboration and support. And I know that children are more prone to anxiety during this period, especially those children with 
with disability or with developmental concerns or developmental delay, children with autism spectrum. I know that anxiety is um, is is more common at this when things like this happen, and so general practitioners would hopefully be asking, how are you coping? Are there any signs of anxiety? And being a bit more proactive about that um, to get a bit of an understanding of what's going on. Um, and then treating that anxiety accordingly and looking at strategies to try and work with that anxiety. And as Nicola said, look to the positives in this in this struggle and look to some of the, the, the important things that you can do at home to try and calm that anxiety that um, that help and you've already, and there's a toolkit that you probably already have as parents and as health professionals that you can use that you can do at home um, and that don't involve going out and about and and so you know drawing on some of those skills that you already have mm, and and as you say hopefully the GP actually has an ongoing relationship with the family and understands the child's situation if the child is bothered by a lack of routine and a disruption to routine at least having some consistency in the person they're working with might be a positive thing. I think hidden in there as well is also the realisation that, you know, this is nothing incredibly specialised. This is a skill set that really I'm mm. imagining people on this webinar would have. I can see you nodding, Julianne. Is that something that you agree with, that this is something that most people can do if they just step up? Yeah, look, and I, I agree with everything that we've all said that, um, in the comments. Steve, it's really important, I think, you know, this special needs and sort of being observing our children. But as us as clinicians, in order to enable therapy to continue, take, you know, this is a unique environment during the online environment. So we've got to be really mindful of what does it look like from the child or the young adult's end. What are they seeing rather than what are we seeing? So I think we've always got to place ourselves out into their world. And so I'm really conscious of making sure they've got a large... These kids with special needs, we do a fair bit of you know, movement work, especially around emotional dysregulation and helping them with their mindfulness or anxiety techniques. So we've, we say to the parents, make sure they've got a large space, not a small room, not in the kitchen, you know, perhaps in the lounge room or somewhere where they've got mo place to move. It doesn't matter if they're not in the screen, the screen doesn't matter. So sometimes the screen's a distraction, so sometimes it's better to have something different for them to look at. Um, I'm really mindful of grounding the kids too so that they feel that they know where I am, what I look like, what I'm wearing. There's a real thing about real time with the kids. Um, is this real or is this weird? You know, are you really here or are you somewhere else? So I often say to them, look, I can see the clock behind you. You know, it's six o'clock. What is it from you? Can you see? What can you see in my room? So that we're really, really trying to tap into the children's visual cues and and also get them some confidence that, you know, we know where they are and we're in their space because it's this is the trickiest bit, I think, is is um, not knowing what else is around for them, what else is happening. Is when they're in our room, our clinic, we control the environment. And I'm really conscious of this is one thing we can't control a lot of, the external, you know, distractions and influences that are happening for them. Um, so I think, you know, kids with special needs, it is, as you said, Steve, it is our core business. We do it every day. But it's just with that unique environment of this screen in front of us and being flexible enough and creative enough to make it a bit of fun. Um, not to, because they had screen overload. Most of them from the age of five right through to year 12 are on screens, you know, six or seven hours a day if they're schooling at home. At home. So then they get us. <laughs> And we, yeah, well, we don't want to be that, how's that anxiety going? Are you having trouble with sleep? You know, they want to make it a bit of, you know, we've got to step it up and make it a bit of fun for them. Yeah, it's interesting seeing some of the chat uh, comments that are coming in while you've been talking, Julianne. People have been oh, okay. saying um, uh, it might be possible for a child with a diagnosed disability to access their core funding through the NDIS um, and even to draw upon other professionals such as occupational therapists who are very much about creating structure and giving some uh, routine and environmental adaptation for people. That might be one way we could spread the um, referral network, I guess. Yeah, I agree with you with that. We've got a strong NDIS business with the work that we do to balance up the Medicare. And yeah. um, we're using a lot of core funding uh, in order to bring in other clinicians and getting some great work with some um, teachers that have got some additional skills working with kids. So we might do some co-consultation there. So I agree with you, yeah. If they're on an NDIS sure. package, it's a, it's a bonus. It really is lovely. 
I'm immediately struck by some of the conversations going on in the group outside about the levels of, well, it's the levels of complexity, I guess, and some people mm. who are already working with bushfire affected families and the pandemic hits, people who are mm. working with refugee families and then the pandemic hits, people who are dealing mm. with uh, families who are stuck overseas who dread the thought of coming back to spending two weeks locked in the mantra or whatever hotels mm. being used. Um, I mean, these are very real concerns. Does anybody in the panel have any thought about how we might help families who have got sort of multiple multiple struggles going on with their children, being impacted by so many things in this horror year? Um, this is Nicola. I'm happy to have a bit of a chat. We've been doing go, some work. Go, with, Nicola. Um, boy, boy. <laughs> uh, I, I said I'd take one. The... the um, I suppose that the the group that we were referencing then um, in terms of communities that I've been working quite a bit with are communities that have been impacted by bushfire um, and, well, communities that often had drought before bushfire. And then Julianne and, and I are kind of interchangeable, it seems, on the video, but I, um, <laughs> I, uh, I'll, I'll look at Julianne while I chat. That's it's a bit confusing. Um, yeah, so working with communities that have that kind of cumulative um, events over the, the, the last couple of years, um, what we were seeing certainly in the, a month or two ago towards the end of last term was an incredible amount of fatigue um, amongst those providing uh, health or educators um, providing provision to families because they just have had um, almost a relentless stream of adversities. So years and years of drought, often fires, um, often floods, and now COVID. And, and COVID's kind of coming in on the back of uh, communities that potentially are trying to pick up um, and implement their recovery strategies, which are all about connection and bringing communities together and spending time together and so forth. But um, that's challenging. Obviously, we can't do that with physical distancing measures. So I think one of the things is just to acknowledge that and to acknowledge the, the limitations. But one of the things as professionals supporting those communities is we have to try and give some of that flexibility of thinking, some of the ideas, because the people in those communities are so worn out. They, it, you can't think flexibly flexibly and creatively when you're completely exhausted. So recognising and sitting with the despair that's there, that's real for these communities. I think the other thing is an acknowledgement and a recognition that a lot of communities feel left behind. So you had communities, you know, it seems crazy that it was only a couple of months ago that everybody was around the world um, absolutely gobsmacked by what our communities went through with the bushfires and now that's been usurped by a global pandemic but that doesn't mean that we've run out of compassion for those communities impacted. Mm -hmm. So I think as clinicians, it's really important that we articulate that and acknowledge it. Um, and at a, at a community level, at an individual level, at a family level, um, and validate just how, how difficult that is and then try to move on. What can we do about it? And, and you're, as a clinician, trying to provide some of those ideas. Well, adolescents are really good at connecting online. We used to tell them off for it. Now we might learn from them. How do they have those connections and relationships and, and uh, opportunities for joy um, and feeling like they're moving forward um, in these times? So I think there's a, there's a job that we do is giving a little bit more of that top brain that can be creative and, and thinking big, particularly that's easy if we're not in those communities because if we're in those communities, we've been impacted ourselves. So that's the other thing to recognise. All the educators and health professionals in those communities are trying to do all of that whilst having their own personal impacts. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's um, a collaboration, sitting with, acknowledging the, the real difficulty, but then trying to move forward and you can only move forward if you feel like you've been listened to and taken seriously and that's whether or not you're five or 105. Yeah, and so the power of empathy but you mentioned giving yeah. a sense of joy how are you how are you giving people joy when everybody seems to be impacted and turned upside down so um, um, completely? Well, I think joy comes through silly giggles, right? You know, there's there's joy in lots of different ways. There's a big push um, around, you know, through social media, the kindness pandemics and, and those sorts of things. But I think the simple, the simple joys, I saw something on ABC for kids uh, today. I don't know if anybody else had watched that gorgeous um, old piece of person's home for four-year-olds that was on talking about the intergenerational you know, the kids that were four going into the old people's home. They've done an update of those kids now in COVID, writing letters to 
to the friends that they made with the people in the old people's homes. And, and so I think it's sharing stories of humanity. It doesn't have to be super complicated. We can all have a giggle, like we're all giggling at TikToks or stuff that we never used to. Um, so, yeah, I suppose they're, they're, they're finding the moments of enjoyment in, in those um, bits and pieces. That would be good. That's what we can do. But, yeah, other people may have, have good ideas as well. Certainly, um, actually, yes. Uh, Andrew, you were going to say something further about finding joy. Yeah, I, I've heard um, Not from a few patients um, about um, that that gratitude and gratefulness and finding gratefulness in the in the good things of the days, and that's um, been a popular one and certainly helps to put a positive energy around the house. So. Um, listing, you know, t one or two things you're grateful for at the end of the day, and and really trying to ch change change our perception of things, and 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 as I said, shift that focus. Um, and certainly, um, it's been a handy tip that I've heard across the board um, with parents and families using it. Absolutely. Um, mm. Anything for you, Julianne, about your approach here? Um, look, yeah, look, I agree with um, Nicola and uh, Andrew too. I think it is it's tapping into how the family finds, um, celebrates and looks at things that are, are funny or humorous. And I think for us as clinicians to ask about that, you know, what do you do to, to have a bit of fun? You know, you're playing games or um, you just, yeah, I agree, you know, the joy thing is really interesting, isn't it? It's so personal, you know, what makes that particular family, that particular person uh, experience joy it can be different from one person to the other. Um, so I think it's linking in with them. You know, I just love to play with the kids and, and say to them, oh, I'm really feeling really funny on this screen right now. You know, how are you feeling? What else is going on? Ask him what else is going on for you. What fun things did they do? And like we're actually, it's just going back to the bushfire thing. In our region, a lot of our communities have been impacted by bushfire. And um, <laughs> there's two things. One is, you know, our other clinicians are sometimes a little bit confused about which Medicare item we use. So that's always a bit of a laugh at our end. Oh, are we COVID bushfire or better access? So that's always like, oh, I don't know. Take a pick. Um, but from the the families that have been impacted by bushfires, look, we're finding that they're loving to engage and chat about stuff that's improving, stuff that's happening. We've had a bucket load of rain up in our region, so it's now shifting to look what's happening while we're getting back into cropping or you know things are different. Uh, look, I just think being human with them, I just love the fact that we yeah. can tell them that this is really, really tricky and tricky has become my new favourite word um, when I don't want to say anything else that might be not acceptable. I say, gosh, it's really tricky. What do you do when things are tricky in your life? And lots of things have happened. Really, tricky is a really good word, isn't it? Because it's sort of, it's, it's yep. mischief, but it's also sinister. It's just a piece of RNA when it all comes down to it. But mm. you know, there is of unpredictability and trickiness about what the pandemic does and how unpredictable mm. it is. I think it's a really interesting word to use. I'm going to mm. take us, I guess, from joy to a bit of despair. There's been a fair few questions asked about the other end of the spectrum when you've got families in these lockdown pressure cooker situations and um, mm. I think things, people talking about everything from family violence through to what happens in such a uh, an unprivate environment for children who are still not um, mm. comfortable revealing their sexuality, gender identity and things like that. Mm. Uh, you haven't got a lot of privacy in order to um, deal with those emerging issues that you're uh, reconciling within yourself. Does anybody have any thoughts for the, for the audience on um, the issues relating to this situation that families are now locked into? Uh, just Julianne here, if that's all right. Yeah, Julianne, particularly, I guess, yeah. on the family violence side of things. Has anybody seen yeah. this coming in? Yes. Yeah. We've had a couple of big uh, situations where that's come to life and we're really finding it hard as clinicians because we're feeling so helpless and isolated and mm. we're, we're really, you know, after a session thinking, you know, and I hope I don't, you know, look, I'm, I'm sure it's what everybody's feeling is that sense of despair ourselves that we're really not able to, to do a lot. We're doing a lot of phone calls back to the GP. So, you know, to try and get some additional help in for some of these families. And it's really hard sometimes to gauge the level of risk when, you know, you're just aware of things might not be right or you're really trying to look extra hard at the situation. And 
you know, ask questions that might not get them the kids into trouble by saying something that's not appropriate in front of whatever parent or caregiver. Um, I'm struggling with it myself from an ethical perspective. But then on the other flip side, as a, in a, in a, you know, with my clinicians that I work with, you know, we're, we're often saying, look, let's ring the GP, let's get the GP involved. You know, we're getting some safety plans with the ED at, the, at our local hospitals so that if they present or telling them, look, maybe you go to hospital or ring access line. But we're doing a lot of access line calls, actually, getting some um, plans in with the access line people so that people know that if they ring, there's already a history for them in access line. That's been quite useful. And also having a relationship with our, we're so privileged in a small rural community to have access to our GPs at the local hospital. So if people present, you know, there's a bit of a history there, you know, we've, we've pre-warned them that things might happen. Um, so I don't have any great answers, except it's a really, really tricky spot. Yeah. Uh, again, you've used the word tricky nicely, done, Julia. Yeah. You've, you've <laughs> deployed a great effect. Uh, yeah, Nicola, but our GP be... relationship has been Andrew? crucial, though. Yeah, sure. just yeah. following on, Julianne, you said linking to the GP, and it's mm -hmm. and that and that's um it's an important network that we create for these more vulnerable patients. I've certainly had a few cases of um, children um, developing quite severe anxiety to the point of aggression, um, family members not feeling safe in the house, um, and mm -hmm. I've had to really assess that risk carefully over the phone. And that's that's a as you said, it's actually a really hard thing to do. It's a, it's it takes a lot of work and it, 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 um, you have to be quite careful with how you do it. And I think the, the, trying to use that telehealth for a general practitioner is, is important. Try to touch base more regularly than you might normally would, um, mm. making more phone calls, um, being a bit more engaged with that family, knowing they are on uh, in, in a bit of a risky situation um, and sort of securing that family, trying to really work with them to secure, to make sure that they're safe and secure um, and that may involve different ways of communicating, as you said, Julianne, that may involve talking differently to, to the children about what's worrying them or, or talking to the, the parent, the caregiver about what's going on. Um, and it might mean having um, more conversations. And so, yeah, it's time consuming. It's stressful. <laughs> um, it's very different. Um, there's ways that we can try to help and any help is good. And I have certainly had more phone calls with with psychologists. We've we've done we've actually done group calls with psychologists. You can add people into the telehealth, which has been something we've never ever done. Um, as well as um, more local to the local services such as CAMS and the hospital, as you said. Um, so a lot more networking going on, and maybe that'll mm. be a good thing in the future that we've actually mm. been able to do this now and learn what's out there. Um, and so that that's my take on it from a GP. Mm. Um, I'm struck by a question that's come in from Felina Pasillo, I guess going a little bit further into this area where Phil's basically asking about the women in particular who are doing triple duty, who are in many cases running a family, doing their job and overseeing the education of their children who are learning from home. I mean, a lot of us use the daily commutes or the popping out for a coffee or whatever it might be as a little bit of a way of um, shifting scenes between roles. I guess when it's all happening within the one house, there must be a, a risk of burnout for people who are really having to pull triple duty without that um, rebooting and refreshing that mm. we, we can put some barriers between the roles. Any comments from the panel about that one? I'm happy to have a chat about that. I think one of the things um, in that Thanks, scenario Nicole. is that if you're doing a triple role, you're doing a triple role. You can't be doing any of it um, perfectly. And I think that's a really important uh, thing to acknowledge. I, I find um, there's a lot of um, conversation narrative going around uh, which I think is really unhelpful for parents around the pressures of homeschool homeschooling. It's actually not homeschooling. Homeschooling is a different thing than having to be at home while your children are getting um, education delivered online. Um, and the expectation that you can sit by your child all day and oversee their education and work full time and run a household is completely unreasonable. And so to, I think the narrative that sets an expectation that that is really important that everybody is on top of all of it is unhelpful. Um, I think the more important narrative is to 
prioritise relationships and connection w- with children. I think obviously when kids are in year 12 and so forth, there is um, greater stakes. But even even then, this is not... So if your child gets struck with a, a significant illness and misses two terms of school, then there are safeguards in place around what is going to happen to they will catch up and in a certain way and, and there'll be accommodations made for them missing that school. The whole universe is going through what we're going through now. So universities, educational settings, workplace settings are going to have to accommodate for what is happening at the moment. And I think there's not enough discussion around the universality of it being something that allows us to think, okay, if if we don't hit six six classes a day and on top of every curriculum point. I've got good friends who are freaking out about their seven-year-olds. You know, they can't get them to do X amount of schoolwork a day. Of course they can't. They're seven year They're twins as well. So there's two of them and they, they, they're kind of not engaged enough by that. But they can play and learn and they've got amazing imaginations and they're creative and, and but they're striving their mother's bonkers and that's not helpful for them. Um, so I think there's a really important I think it's missing and I think that part of what's happening in Australia is the conflicting, everyone's getting focused on the conflicting messages about to send to school, not send to school, to send to school, not send to school. Um, And that's distracting from actually what the message I think could be, which is regardless, we're going through something that's unprecedented. Forget about performance at the moment and focus on how we're all travelling. And you talk about how can you find those transitions or coffee breaks or, or space breaks. Like, I think it comes back to that joy conversation. Each kid in whatever year they're in, part of their curriculum is sports or mindfulness or downtime, like that's worked in there. So, you know, if you're a mum at home with your kids, can you try and, you know, do the yoga together and have a laugh with it, you know, get on the, dress up and do a, you know, an 80s aerobics dance. I don't know, like just little snippets where you're merging the two but having a bit of a sense of humour about it and, and taking that performance pressure which is high enough in any time I think um, but at the moment I just think it's really unhelpful and unrealistic um, to expect anyone to do and I think there's a, a real role for a stronger narrative around giving everybody a break. Absolutely I'm I'm keeping my medical students deeply amused by splicing music of the new romantics into the <laughs> webinar audience but I'm finding it hilarious I don't think they're quite so sure but one thing I did find amusing this week, um, and it was done very sincerely, was the rather gorgeous Peter Doherty, the immunologist who, uh, whose um, eponymous institution uh, at my university has been very much involved in the battle against the pandemic. He, people might have seen this. He put uh, on Twitter just the line, Dan Murphy's opening hours, uh, thinking right. that he was on two. <laughs> Now, that caused much hilarity, but some people are appropriately questioning in the uh, question manager here, the question box here, about the use of alcohol and other drugs. You know, money has come in through government grants to families who might have some um, problems with discretion in their spending. There's a surge in drug and alcohol use as people try and manage with these things. Is this something, I mean, imagining, Andrew, you're probably seeing this in general practice or also with the physical effects of drug and alcohol use? Is it something that's had a bit of a surge? Yeah, and it's something we would normally screen for anyway with um, with the work we do, but I'm noticing now there are people turning to alcohol in particular um, as they try to cope with the stress of what's happening and maybe that's um, become their their coping mechanism. And I'm, I, you know, I've, I've had some quite large... Um, i heard people having quite large amounts of alcohol and that's... Um, I guess, for, from a GP point of view, um, it's it's concerning in that it, it they're obviously struggling at home and they are looking to other ways to deal with maybe the the stress or the boredom or the different long time that they're spending at home, and this is their go-to. And so I would be on to that quite quickly and get and and then look at other coping strategies, early referral to psychology, really getting that support in place early. Um, knowing that um, they are in that sort of period of isolation um, and, and the same with drug use and especially down to the teenagers, I'm seeing um, a little spike in, in drug use as they sort of spend more time maybe 
um, with themselves and, and that's concerning as well. So yeah, just getting that, that support in early and, and dealing with it and looking at where this is coming from and if there is an emerging mental illness that possibly is starting to arise as they struggle with what's going on and that's um, also worth looking at and we explore that with them. Great, Andrew. And it's mm -hmm. quite remarkable the 2,626 people who are having a conversation on the side or I guess coming up with <laughs> other solutions that people might be interested in looking at as well. One that I've just noticed here that somebody mentioned is, um, can we think, this is something that came up when we were discussing before the webinar started uh, or a week or two ago, what about the child for whom this um, home lockdown is seen as a bit of a boon, so the school refuser or the child who has anxiety issues about going to school. I mean, we will have to talk before we finish this evening about how we're planning for return to school and the anxiety about returning into that sort of environment. But are people seeing anything at the moment about uh, children who are sort of saying, this is great, I know our dogs and some cats are saying that, but what about the child who's <laughs> finding being home with um, mum and dad and everybody, if that's their family setting, are as happy as Larry? Steve, I found the younger children seem to be a little bit more resilient, maybe a little bit less aware of what's going on. And this is obviously very child and family dependent. Um, but um, as a father of a six and a four year old, I've definitely noticed a bit of ignorance with what's going on. And perhaps that's a good protective factor that these young children have and um, sort of really um, distracted in their own little world and, and not so much um, of what the world is like around them. And maybe also, Minimising media exposure in the house helps along that way as well and trying to just keep keep um, things in perspective with this age group. Um, whereas the older children that I've seen in the clinic here tend to be the ones that really latch on to these terms like pandemic and crisis and, and, and the death rate and all that. And I've had children today, you know, teen, young teenagers and, and that, that older age group who, who said they don't want to go back to school because they don't want to be spreading or catching it from other mm. children at school. And that's um, obviously the sort of the differences between age groups is the awareness of that old group. So what sort of words mm. are you using with that age group, the teenagers who are oh, I, I, about I, I, spreading I feel, a pandemic? I still think it's important to be honest and let them know what's going on and, and be upfront about it and to, to let them know there is a virus going around, but also offer that reassurance and let them know that this is, this is something that will pass. This is generally safe for children and you will be okay. And we're seeing that it is safe to return. And so to, to sort of um, gently support them through that um, and uh, understand where that anxiety is coming from, but really open, honest language and being, and being direct about it. And these kids already know probably a lot about it anyway, without um, us um, speaking to them, uh, but trying to find out what they know and what they understand about it. And then to clarify anything that's sort of not clear or being exaggerated. I think it's important to think about temperament Sorry. as well. Like I was just going to say, you know, temperament has got a lot to do with it, but also location. You know, like we've just been told in the ACT today that there's zero cases. You know, we've had three deaths. Everyone else has recovered. Um, so it's a, it's very situational dependent, you know. So if you're in a situation here in the ACT, you know, I've got two teenagers at home. They're, they're fine. You know, they're... We can still go outside, they can go and shoot. If they don't go out and exercise regularly, they go stir crazy, but we still have, there's still a lot of freedom for them. And, and they're quite comfortable, I think, and them and their friends, um, they think they're doing the right thing. It all feels relatively um, okay. They worry if we go out. They worry if we if I go into the hospital setting for my work, and you know they want to know why I'm going. And but I think that you're right. Those those conversations and temperament, as much as age, I think is going to drive kids' mm. um, concern about this, and also what their their loved ones do. You know, if we can tell them, you know, your parents do this, or your grandparents like the auntie and uncle. You know, it's going to be very different versus living in a situation in in some of the metro cities, perhaps where there's clusters, or your grandma's in a, a nursing home where there's, um, you know, some of the the really frightening things going on there. So that. We can't assume anything that kids are going to be a uniform um, response to this. It's not that young kids aren't worried and older kids are or uh, vice versa, I don't think. And that's and even kids within the family, we all know, you know, just because their siblings doesn't mean they have the same temperament or the same, 
um, response to any event. So that's why it's worth checking in because you might have one kid who's completely blasé about it and a bit of an extrovert. Um, meanwhile, your other child is quite anxious but isn't raising it because they might feel silly because everybody else feels... It feels like that's so not what the dynamic is. Yeah, so checking in, I think, is, is worth doing. And I know... Um, Julianne, you would talk a bit about it. I haven't come across this myself, but kids having that conversation about being fear, the fear of being spreaders themselves. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, let's just think about some words. I'm not sure if others are getting the same image of Nicola, but you look like you're being rendered by a French Impressionist painter at the moment. <laughs> quite, a, quite a fetching look, which we'll leave you with. But um, look, that's really interesting. One of our learning mm-hmm. objectives is about the uh, terminology used. Now, yeah. Julia, and you use the word tricky, which I just love because it has that sense of wickedness and willfulness and unpredictability. And, and I think Nicola's appropriately reminded us that all children are different, have different personalities and different ways of going about the world. What about with the um, six, seven-year-old who is anxious about uh, being told that they might infect and maybe kill their grandparent. That was the early mm-hmm. messaging hearing. What sort of words can we use for them to reassure them that they are able to re-engage with their grandparents when that becomes a nationwide option? I know you've been through it, so maybe you can talk from the heart about this one. Well, I was, as I was relating to you earlier, when uh, I visited my grandchildren just last night, over, you know, I haven't seen them, I haven't touched them for about a month. We've been doing the whole waving from the veranda, dropping off care packs and just doing the whole distancing. And my kids and all my grandkids are really, really worried about me still working too. So I've actually had to guarantee my children. And I've got a, a husband who's got some chronic health issues. So they're really worried that I'm not going to kill their, their father and their grandfather. So that's always been an ongoing conversation, which is interesting. And I have to guarantee them. I show them my sprays, my hand gels. I talk to them a lot about... Actually, one thing I've got is a glitter bug. So the best thing we've got in this practice for this is where you actually put the blue light on your hands. I wash them with... I, I put the blue light on my hands and I can actually see my hands here now. And um, you can see how much bugs are on my hands and I wash them under soap and put them under water and then I put the glitter bug on it. And you can actually see the difference it makes. So I do that a lot when I get the kids in the room and I've used that with my children and said, look, you can be guaranteed I'm being very careful. We're doing the elbow touching. We're spacing out I put my arm out a lot to show this my distancing and I'm normalizing it and making a bit of play about it um, and I, as I was saying to all earlier with my grandchildren they said um, when I, we got the first hug yesterday and my um, 11 and 10 year old granddaughter said grandma have you been sprayed <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes I have been sprayed and the That's example of that to all you people listening is a spray <laughs> bottle with alcohol in it and uh, my son's been using it to spray everything because it kills everything. So, yes, I spray my hands with David's special alcohol. And so the kids were quite happy that I'd sprayed. And if I'd sprayed, I could then hug so, them because then it was quite humorous. And so I, I guess I'm it's going... given a visualisation of what this looks like. I mean, the President of the United yeah. States seems to struggle with understanding what the actual enemy looks like here. But what you've done is give them some visual representation of what it is that we're struggling with, something that physical, mm. tactic, um, sort of pragmatic they can do in dealing with it. Mm. I think that's a really interesting idea. And, I mean, we did talk about, I guess, the early messaging that went around. And in some ways, for those of my age group, it was reminiscent of the HIV or the AIDS um, yeah. epidemic that started, that, you know, the, the issue about, you know, killing other people through your behaviour and the fear mm. and... Uh, marginalisation that caused. I do see a question that's come in from Sarah Mason. Now, we've been so lucky or so well managed with the pandemic, I guess, that the death rate's not been nearly as high as we were worrying it would be when planning this webinar. But there is a question about highly populated Aboriginal areas and the Mm. importance of um, observing funerals and community gatherings. Has anybody had to deal with a family that's not been able to engage in their usual ceremonial acknowledgement of death during this time, and children particularly. Yeah, we That's had a, a family here. We had um, one deck in our community, and it was a huge amount of outpouring of his family had been affected by bushfires and had lost all their possessions, and then Grandma was on one of the um, New Zealand ships and then died, which was really quite tragic for the family. And the anger and the frustration of one not being able to touch her and be with her as she was dying because obviously she was in isolation. The family were gowned up one at a time. 
it was very traumatic for them. What I've done with that is um, used narrative and doing some of that grief work with them and storytelling um, and also doing some of that with the grief work, looking at connecting bonds and continuing bonds. You know, you might not have been there, but, you know, what would grandma be thinking? What was going on? Getting stories about her life and ways that they would, you know, connect mentally with her. Um, we're doing a lot of that narrative grief work with people that have been through this terrible tragedy of losing somebody um, and just trying to explain to them about, you know, this is, this is something that will pass. We can celebrate them later. Um, I've got another lady who's got her husband dashes. She just picked up the other day, and it's what you know. She doesn't know what to do now for a memorial, and what. So it's it's just talking through very very gently. I think holding people. I often feel our job is to sit there and just hold this grief, and let them say and just agree with them, and and have that sense of connection as human to human in this state, and just really let them know that we this is so sad. And there's no other word for it. It is so sad, it's unavoidable. Then when it passes, what will we do? Well, that's certainly a topic we will be talking about, what happens with the re-entry to society, because mm -hmm. there are a number of questions and chats about what about the withdrawn child who is just very happy in their room and that they're going to mm -hmm. really be confronting it. Maybe we should talk about that now. It does seem to be a topic mm -hmm. that's coming up a lot. <clears throat> How are we going to prepare children for returning to whatever is considered normal on the other side of this pandemic. Um, mm. Any thoughts about that? Has anybody started, any of the three of you started preparing families, given that we don't know if there's going to be another surge or not, but what sort of messages have you been giving families? I'm happy to have a quick chat about that, Steve. I think yeah, the, Nicola, um, one of the, the work that we've been doing looking at supporting children around um, not necessarily yet returning to school, but I think we have a lot that we can draw from and I've been looking at a lot of the work overseas as well around uh, supporting children following community trauma events, so disasters, um, floods, terror events and so forth. And we've I've spent the last couple of years of my life working in, in this space and so the pandemic can be characterised as a community trauma event, um, an international event. So we do have a lot of science and knowledge to draw on in terms of what supports children's returning to um, schools following mass incidents. So whether or not that might be, unfortunately, the states have a lot of work around, you know, terrible shootings and so forth. But um, in Australia, we were doing a lot of work with schools already around returning to school following the bushfire season. And so there is a lot of knowledge out there um, around what supports children's well-being. Um, there will be separation anxiety on both sides from children and from parents. Um, there is after disaster, there will be after a pandemic. Um, I think along with a lot of what else we've been talking about tonight is for people supporting families is you know how to do this. We know how to support an individual. Like we've all worked with children and young people who experience separation anxiety and how to help them get back to school. And so as practitioners, it can feel like we've never done this before, but we have done it before. It's just doing it in a, a different context. And so the things that we would be suggesting around supporting children and families to get back to school are the same that we would be recommending on an individual level. If we had a, a child that was suffering, um, you know, had been refusing to go to school for months at end, whether or not an adolescent or a young child. Um, routine, connection, relationship, um, they sound simple but they're the things that we know that are really important. Um, preparation, choice and control, where we can offer it um, and scaffolding kids back into that situation um, is best practice and what helps. Yeah, So working out how they can go back in. The one thing that um, we know in, in the disaster context that helps is the universality of it, that a whole community has gone through it. So actually coming back mm. in together and having um, those around you that have been through the same thing is a huge sense uh, source of comfort and reassurance for kids. They might not think it's going to be, but having that taste of going back in and having connection and story sharing about what went on and what happened and what it was like and so forth. So I think taking courage and reassurance that we actually have done a lot of this in the past, not at this level, but we've all returned to school after um, 
tragic events or educators have to cope with these sorts of um, community events all, all the time, whether it be a death of a student or a, um, a suicide in a community. These sorts of ruptures unfortunately happen all the time. This is a, this is a big one, but the, the practices that support families remain the same. Um, so we can kind of draw on that, draw on that knowledge, and I think there's some really good work being done around the application of that that work and science around community trauma events that's being that we can draw on um, in these times. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and I think one thing that's becoming apparent too in talking to other clinical colleagues is that people aren't presenting with the everyday issues, and I'm sure Andrew's seeing this in general practice. Some people have been mentioning in the chat the fear, I guess, of the impending surge of um, suppressed mental health issues or things that have been set aside and that whether part of the emergence from this quarantine period is going to be sort of an overwhelming um, load of uh, unmet mental health needs. Andrew, is this something that mm. you're expecting and are preparing for? I was just thinking with what you said there about um people sort of shying away a little bit from medical care. We were very quiet to start with in that March, early April period. And I, to the point where I started ringing a few of my regular patients and saying, where are you? What's going on? And the answer <laughs> was, we just don't want to, we don't want to bother you. We don't want to, we feel like the, the, the things we have were silly. We don't want to come in um, mm -hmm. or we don't want to go into a medical environment because we're scared, you know, so it's, it's, um, it's taken a lot of work over April, throughout April to really provide some reassurance that, you know, the medical clinics are fairly, I, I tell them it's cleaner than cold. Um, we have a <laughs> lot of cleaning going on. We're a very safe environment. And so we do have the opportunity now to see people face to face. But in answer to your question, um, I'm cautiously waiting to see what happens next, trying to get in early now to support families through what could come next and, to let them know that we are available for those routine healthcare um, needs as well as any mental health needs as they arise. And um, certainly amongst families I see, I've had them, uh, some kids and families say, oh, we didn't know the GP did that. Um, we didn't know you could help with that. So just letting them know we are available. We can do mental health care plans as um, if needed. We can involve psychology. But just being able to, as, as Nicola said really nicely, being able to hold a family and to um, have have that connection with them is sometimes therapeutic on its own. In terms of what happens in the future, we don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think about today and the present moment mm. and what we're dealing with today. We don't know what's going to come, um, but um, I can only hope that we're starting to build a system now that, that helps um, with, with what, what might come. And, um, and we, you know, as a, as a team, we work towards... Um, to, to helping these children. What do you think, Julianne? Oh, look, I love listening to you both. One of them, I'm so engrossed in um, the content and how you're talking. It's just beautiful work. Um, look, some of the things we're doing is, um, you know, using a lot of St Luke's innovative resources too with families. I'm finding they're fabulous. But as Nicola was talking, I was, I've been so struck since I've met you and found out it was only just before you know we started working with this I got onto the Emerging Minds website and found you have no idea the amount of amazing resources that are on that website and your podcast. I think I listen to a new one every night um, in preparation <laughs> for tonight as well. And honestly, because they are fabulous resources and I've actually been showing a lot of my families the, the podcast and saying download this app. There's some fabulous things to listen to and really you've done an incredible job with the resources on your site for families and children. I've absolutely loved it and wow. I think some of the advice in your podcast has been fabulous for me as a clinician as to how to sit with people and what to expect and how to prepare for what might come through the door tomorrow and just to have things ready is, um, is quite crucial. So. Yeah, I, it's just I agree with everything that you've all said. It's, it's, it's getting through today, knowing we've got lots of amazing resources. The, the things that I've found, I've just found another amazing resource today. I just can't remember where I found put it. And I'll, I'll send it through to the panellists. But it's just, there's some great stuff that we can use. Um, but what I've been using a lot with my kiddies, and I've been playing around with, um, you know, getting very savvy with the computer now, is putting up those St. Luke's innovative resources on our shared screen with them so we can do things 
around, and they've got some great stuff and anxiety and great things around, you know, coasting. There's one about um, dealing with waves, so we're using metaphors to deal with what might be happening. Um, yeah, that's all, that's all I can think of at the moment. I know, that'll be good. Uh, actually, one thing I did want to talk to the people about is the issue of privacy while consulting. Mm. This is something that we all discussed in planning for the webinar, which has come mm. up a number of times in the questions and discussions about how we do actually assist people to get some privacy when you've got a newborn baby and a three-year-old climbing up your leg and you're trying to talk about really mm. emotional things. Has anybody found any good strategies for trying to encourage people to find a private space to have that conversation? Yes, Steve, we do a lot of work with the families. Before. Our admin girls are working so hard. They do. We've got a protocol that we've got in place whereby um, they've got things to ask. So we ring the week before, like on the most of, like today was what's the show, Thursday. So the admin girls would be ringing all the clients for the week, the week four or five days before make sure they understand about privacy. We make sure we get a consent, either emailed out and in. They, we tell them about setting up a private room. Are they worried about privacy? Is there something they'd like to do later? Um, you know, we're really unpacking that for them and saying it's really important that you have a space to talk. You know, if there's important things that you can tell us things, you know, I've got worries about, you know, people being there. We talk to the parents first as well or whoever the caregivers are. So, and then we ring the morning of as well or, you know, about two or three hours before the session just to make sure that the things that we talked about earlier in the week are still okay today. So it's taking a lot of extra work to ensure that people are safe and secure, but I think it's well worth it. And it's also another contact with the family or the young person. And I'm finding fantastic engagement. The kids are talking to me about their rooms or their lounge rooms or they go outside. Um, they're downloading Zoom on their phone so the older teenage kids can go outside or go to a private space. Um, I've spoken to a few adults about the importance of giving them privacy and not sneaking mm. around the corner. Um, I've actually had to be really angry in a very polite way with some families and just say, look, you know, you've got to understand this is their time, you know, and you're impinging on their time. So sometimes I've, I'm the stern mother as well or the stern counsellor um, mm. and impact, you know, really stressing the importance of this. Um, of course, and also in pressing on the kids too that what I say to them here where I work is private but what they say to me is mm. not listened to by a colleague or others so that's important too mm. I think and that I'm not taping it mm. Nicola or Andrew sorry. did you have a comment you to add to that? I was just going to say Steve sorry to um, hope I'm not interrupting um, but uh, I was just going to say from a GP perspective I, I try to keep it simple we do get a consent before we start talking you know, letting them know this is a telehealth conversation um, that it, you know, it's not recorded it's for our benefit to have this discussion um, and if it isn't a mum or a dad I'm talking to I'll, I'll ask them is it okay to talk at the moment are we, are we free to chat would you like to step outside before we talk you know making sure they've got that that their own privacy in their own world um, if it's a teenager and Julianne you mentioned um, sometimes teenagers actually talk a lot more on the on a telehealth yeah. consult so mm -hmm. I'm getting some really fascinating discussions with some of the the, the um, adolescent age group that I would mm. never have had face to face in the clinic here, and and trying to um, uh, mm. let them know that if you want to talk on your own, please you know go into a private space so we can do that. Um, not always perfect. We just do what we can do and and do our best, and and, and that's all. You know, any any therapy is better than nothing. Mm. Yeah, totally agree. I'm seeing a few questions come in about what about families who are broken um, by. Mm. Uh, all sorts of issues and maybe court interventions and things like that. Grandparents often can be kept away from children because of disputes within families. Have any of the three of you seen situations like that? And have you got any tips or strategies that might be helpful in trying to uh, maybe not reconcile families, but help them cope with this added burden? I still, we've had quite a few and we've got um, several families that being on the border, the kids are in another state, they've gone to a family member and haven't been able to come home because the borders were shut down. So those families are really, really, really struggling and where there's some um, difficulties between the relationships. But I don't have any answers to this at all except I keep saying to the families that come in, this must be the hardest thing, you know, just engaging with them. But also giving them 
you know, sort of, I've had to find an awful lot of stuff out myself. This is not an area where we've done a lot of work, but we're now seeing a lot of people coming in. But finding out about the court, the family court law, um, places that I can refer them on to so they can get advice and information. So um, I find, you know, the um, law courts with a um, legal aid online, things I'm sending people to that a lot. Um, yeah, it's been really hard. We're getting some fathers who haven't seen their children for quite some time. Mm. Um, what I've been doing with some of those is just actually doing some grief work over there. There's things I often can't change. So, you know, how do they cope with uncertainty and things I can't change? So a lot of it is that humanity, person-to-person -person engagement, I think. Um, I don't have a lot of answers to some of this. I'm not sure whether Nicola and Andrew or even yourself, Steve, have any other great... You know, insight Nicholas, do you have do. Any, any thoughts or even about families who I guess have been impacted by job losses? Now that's another whole pressure on yeah. families. I think I think the um on the, any of those complex situations, you know, in my clinical work you've done a lot of work with families that are separated and going through family court and, you know, quite adversarial and so forth. And I think what we're talking about is this is further complicated by the current situation. Um it's a bit of a, a combination, I think, of validating it and trying to move people forward because often when families are stuck in that really adversarial circumstance before coming into what's happening now, there's not often um, a lot of capacity in those families, in the adults, for flexibility of thinking. Um, there's a lot of uh, hurt, a lot of grief, um, and a lot of rigidity <laughs> um, and a, a great tendency to blame the other partner for, for how bad things are going, none of which is in the interest of children. Um, so I think part of our role is to listen in to it, to, as you say, validate how difficult it is, but try to shift them into what can you do about it and, and, and offer that advice or that recommendation that whilst you may not be able to see your children at this time, that what a great benefit it is for you to connect with them in some way, um, whether that be through phone calls or old-fashioned letters or text messages or so forth. So I think there's um, a role we can play as, as listening but also helping to move people out of that stuckness um, because that's not helpful if, if adults are stuck in a, a place of mm. hopelessness and um, resentment about the situation, then that's going to flow through and make kids even more anxious. Um, now that happens without COVID in, in really acrimonious um, situations. So I think, again, those, those skills that we know how to when we're working with two parents or two families, and we, we all do do that quite a lot, and kids are going back and forth and back and forth, the principles that we talk to parents about, don't make the children the messenger, you know, put your children's needs first, um, focus on the relationship you have with the child, and, you know, all, all those prioritise those sorts of things. I think those messages stand. Um, we can be compassionate about it, but also I think our role is always around pulling into focus the needs of the child and, the, and, and and what's in the best interest of children and you know we all sit with a with a hope that the um, all parents want to do the best by their children and so we can listen with it but we also need to move them a little bit into that space of of of, of working with what we can because yeah, otherwise absolutely. It, it, yeah I, I fully agree I do want to pick up on a question from Alice which is a very practical point about what happens if a uh, client records the consultation at their end without you being aware of that. It's interesting that for a lot of us, I guess, every time we meet with a client and they put their smartphone down on the desk, you mm. um, I think that might be, Nicola, is that your microphone picking up your breathing? Maybe just move it from your mouth a little bit or somebody's really, somebody's really enjoying the conversation otherwise. Um, that, uh, but that's something, I guess, which is no different here. We've got to make an assumption that a client is recording what we're saying, and obviously we wouldn't be saying anything that we wouldn't want to be or we wouldn't be comfortable being recorded. Does anybody have any practical experience of that? I guess no, that's that that to mm. presume you're being recorded if that's, uh, if that's the situation. Look, Steve, I think that's good advice. I actually can say that's not something I had thought of, that the client would be taping. So um, I'm glad it's come up tonight because I've not thought of that. And I agree with you. Just assume you're going to be recorded and ensure that, um, you know, you're safe. Whatever you say is, is okay. Be very measured and make sure in any clinical situation that what you say is 
is um, is okay. We contacted yeah. our solicitors when this first started about, you know, is the information, the therapy and the advice given covered by our insurance? And they did guarantee us that, you know, therapy is therapy, advice is advice, regardless of the, the setting or the um, mechanism of delivering it. So, but I, yeah, I'm honestly, I hadn't thought of that. Mm. Mm. Melissa, I'm glad it came up. is also struck by that. It never occurred to her that this would have mm. happened during the gap. It's something we need to be aware of. Others are yeah. also saying that this might be an opportunity that sometimes with a teenager particularly, like those of us that have taught our children to drive, to sit beside a teenager, is sometimes a better way to have a conversation, like when you're out walking. This might actually be, as some people have said, that there could be some um, improved communication with people who you're not as face-to-face with, that the technology mm. might actually assist with the communication. Steve, could I say something? Yes, of course, Anne. Um, yeah, uh, one of the terms we use in general practice is the safety net patients. And just a bit of an extension of what you're saying about, you know, potentially a patient's recording. I'd, I do like to ensure that we are, and we have to go a little bit a little bit more um, thorough, we'd be a bit more thorough with this on the phone, but safety netting and letting them know where they can turn to should they need it um, in terms of help and support um, and protecting yourself as much as you're protecting them. So, you know, are they aware of the local contact numbers, emergency help numbers, Lifeline, Beyond Blue? Um, uh, do they have those numbers on their phone available to them? So I just, um, yeah, I just wanted to touch base on that as well. Okay, so obviously being concerned for our client self is important. What about ourselves? I mean, we've talked about how this is affecting everybody. Do you have any thoughts for the participants about what we might do to look after our own health at this stage? Maybe this is, we're in the last few minutes now. What are the thoughts of each person on how we can look after ourselves during this time? Do you know what I've loved from COVID? We've got a couple of sites. And we do a Friday afternoon Zoom drink. And I'm loving it. I've never had such fun with my colleagues before as we try to get on the screen and share whatever, perhaps it's a coffee or tea or I prefer bubbles. And we, we just, we've never done that before. If we, you know, we play in the Christmas mid-year event. We're doing a Friday, 6 o'clock, downtown. We last client's gone, hopefully. And um, and we are really loving it. We laugh and joke. We're not allowed to talk clients or work. We talk about stuff. And it's been the best part. I actually now look forward to Friday night. Well, I do anyway, but this has been really good fun. Um, so and that, I wouldn't that, have done that without COVID. A bit of that joy we were talking about before. Absolutely. Any thoughts yep. from, from Andrew or Nicola? I think we all need some mental space. Uh, we've got yeah. the added pressure of being on the front line of this and taking that home. Some of us have families as well and the dual role there. And so um, I, I think creating some mental space has been one of the, the most beneficial things to myself. That might be as simple as a few minutes, you know, to yourself through to um, 30 minutes where I can do a bit of exercise or do something else that I enjoy that's positive. Um, just getting that energy back and being able to focus back on what we're dealing with. And, and I, I try not to watch the news every night and do those things that really absorbs you more in it. I try to have a bit of an escape from it at home. Um, and I think that's it. So just, just buying that little bit of time to yourself is, is a great investment. That was certainly a tip that came up for clients as well about limiting screen time for children and media time um, and being reasonable and not being completely immersed in the pandemic all hours of the day. Mm. Nicola, any final thoughts from you in our last couple of minutes? I think um, one of the things is is when we go physically to work, um, we have some boundaries in place when we leave that workplace. And if we're working from home, they might not be as set in stone. So I think being very conscious of that um, and having some signifiers, not all of us can kind of leave even, you know, to a separate part of the house or so forth. But a protecting some privacy, if you're going to be doing consults and so forth, you know, what are you comfortable sharing about yourself and your personal space? It's, it can be helpful to share a bit, but don't share more than you're comfortable. And then have some signifiers, breaks and so forth as much as you can. But, you know, we don't need to dress up necessarily. You know, we might have the pyjamas on the bottom, but, you know, work clothes on top. But um, I think there's a, a, a helpful thing for to step out of that at the end of the day. So put your most comfy thing on at the end of the day, but also try to be really disciplined about not checking emails 24-7 and just because it's available. I think 
we tell clients to do it all the time to establish boundaries and, and stick to them and prioritise some time to ourselves. Um, we have to kind of walk the walk, otherwise we'll all fall over and then we're no good to anybody. Absolutely. So thank you to the three of you so much. I must say I've really enjoyed chatting with um, valued colleagues this evening. It's been an excellent uh, for me session. So from a personal level, thank you very much indeed. There are just a few things to finish up on, um, which is to ask people to complete the exit survey and to provide uh, feedback. Now there's a survey icon at the top right of the screen. If you could uh, fill out that um, survey or wait for it to pop up. There are some webinars coming up that I think will be of huge interest to people. Uh, next Monday, um, there's one on Aboriginal children and the effects of intergenerational trauma, so a vital topic on the 4th of May. And then also very practical, building on, and the reason we haven't gone into huge detail on the technology tonight is there is another webinar coming up on the 18th of May, Monday in two weeks' time, with bits and strategies in using technology for mental health consultations, uh, and that's on Monday the 18th, as I say. One thing that I wanted to finish off on, though, is just, I guess, the final reminder, a few slides just to flip through there. Those are just the ones I was talking about there. But also just the final reminder that um, I would like to acknowledge that all of us are in this together, as has been said by a lot of people um, in our past few weeks. But I would like to acknowledge the lived experience of people and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. So thank you so much to our presenters this evening. For all of you who have been so active in the chats, look after yourselves and stay socially safe. Thank you for your participation tonight. Goodbye.